How you doing class? Today, I want to talk about scansion. Now, this is a topic that scares a lot of people because it deals with iambic pentameter, but it's really not that hard. You just need to remember a few rules before you can understand it. So before I begin, let me define what scansion and iambic pentameter are. Scansion is the analysis and notation of a line of verse, and iambic pentameter is a specific type of verse that Shakespeare and others used. Iambic pentameter consists of a ten-syllable long line with a specific pattern. The pattern is known as an iam, and it's unstressed, stressed, or titum, just like a heartbeat. Titum, 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 titum. Each two-syllable section is called a foot. So, five iambic feet equals a line of metered verse, hence the penta part of iambic pentameter. One of the things to remember about verse is that when it's perfectly regular, it's pretty boring. So, Shakespeare used to throw in irregularities to uh, spice it up. One of the most common irregularities is called the feminine ending. The feminine ending is a line that has 11 syllables instead of 10. And the last syllable is unstressed. It's generally thought to be a weaker ending than the regular ten-syllable masculine ending, which is probably why it was named after the weaker sex. Now, don't get me started on why this makes no sense nowadays, but times were different when these things were named. Feminine endings are great because they show a character who's unsure of themselves, which is dramatically interesting. In fact, the most famous line in all of Shakespeare is a feminine line. To be or not to be, that is the question. Notice how the last word, question, ends unstressed. Side note, there's another possible irregularity there, but we'll get to it later. When Hamlet says that line, he's completely unsure of everything in his life. He has a wrathful ghost dad demanding he kill his uncle, but he needs to gather enough evidence to prove that his uncle is guilty of killing his ghost dad, or else killing his uncle will send him immediately to heaven. On top of that, Hamlet is questioning his own life and if he should keep living it. If anyone is unsure of his course of action, it's this dude, and he shows this by adding that extra unstressed syllable. All that subtext with just a simple addition. The next irregularity is an extremely common one. It's called a trochee, and it's basically the opposite of an iam. It's a foot that has a stressed syllable first, and then an unstressed syllable. An easy way to remember that a trochee is called a trochee is because a trochee is itself a trochee. And the stresses are written like this, with a dash and then a dip. Starting a line with a trochee is an easy way to grab the listener's attention. For example, Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention! Or, Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. Both of those examples were the beginning of their respective plays. Starting a show with a trochee is an easy way to snap the audience's attention and get them listening to you. Wait, so if a character speaks in I am's, then they're iambic. Would that make Puck's epilogue in Midsummer Night's Dream be trochaic? Yes! You see, Puck speaks trochaically and not iambically, because iams are how humans speak, and Puck is not a human. But in his case, being trochaic is not an irregularity. Now, remember when I said before that to be or not to be had a second possible irregularity? It's this one. Some actors pronounce, and some scholars argue, that the line should be spoken to be or not to be. That is the question. Instead of to be or not to be. That is the question. The former being written this way, and the latter being written this way. Now, both have their strengths and their weaknesses, and it's really up to the production and the reader to find out which one works for them. Now, the last two irregularities I want to talk about are Pyrrhix and Spondees. Now, there's a couple more, like Anapests and Dactyls, but they're super uncommon in Shakespeare, and when you're speaking the text, you can usually jump over them by eliding. Elision is what happens when you take out a syllable from one or more words. It's what we do when we say gonna and wanna. You're really saying going to or want to, but you're taking out a syllable most likely to save time, which is really what happens when Shakespeare's characters do it, too. 
A pyrrhic is a foot that has no stressed syllables. And a spondy is a foot that has two stressed syllables. The reason I'm grouping them together is because in Shakespeare, they're often right next to each other. Like this example from Comedy of Errors. Why, mistress, sure my master is horn mad! In that example, the last foot is a spondy, and the one right before it is a pyrrhic. One reason that a character would use a pyrrhic spondy combo is to put a special emphasis on the spondy portion by de-emphasizing the pyrrhic portion. Now that you know some of the mechanics of Shakespearean poetry, you can apply it to your text and hopefully it will open up some hidden meanings that would have been lost otherwise. And as an actor, knowing the rules will allow you to break them intelligently. The world of Shakespeare is incredibly complex, and poetic metrics are only a small part of the whole picture, but knowing Scansion gives you a place to start seeing it. Thanks for watching, and remember, always cite your sources.